Welcome to Shop Talk Live. Uh, this is episode 19, 48 countries today. Um, so uh, this is the biggest episode that we've done yet. Uh, a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, this episode is called Convenience Store Transformation the Danish Way. And uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, Copenhagen um, in, in Denmark, which is the first stop on our uh, global world tour, um, which is, is what we're really going to focus on for the first series of episodes in 2021. So um, I'm very pleased uh, to, to uh, welcome my first guest, Cecilia Lind, uh, who's founder of The Protein Kitchen. Welcome, Cecilia. Thank you so much, Dan. So how are you doing? I'm doing good. So far, so good. <laughs> no COVID, so that's good. How are you? Very good. Very good. Very well, thank you. Um, delighted that you could join us. And thank you, by the way, for the, um, the store tours that you filmed, uh, which a lot of the audience have been watching over the weekend. That was great. We'd love to be in Copenhagen, of course, but we, we can't be there. But it was, uh, it was good to, to be there through your visits. Thank you. I tried to show all the beautiful aspects of some of them in Copenhagen. So there's a lot to show. I hope that people enjoyed it. Absolutely. Now, I think we're all curious, um, Cecilia, how did you get into this business? I mean, what brought you to, um, to convenience? Yeah, what brought, I mean, the story is quite long. Uh, and since I don't have too much time, I'll try to, to do it short. <laughs> but I've always been into, you know, been passionate about health and, and sports and and I've always wanted to do something with that, but I was actually within the IT business. So I was working with Microsoft in a corporate, corporate office. And my mom, she taught me everything she knew in, in a kitchen. And she always dreamt about creating something uh, like a health food business. And she always told me that that was her dream. And she actually started something called the Good Choice Kitchen in Norway. And half a year later, she, she passed away suddenly. And at that point, it, it's kind of cliche, but I kind of stopped and, and thought, what do I want to do with my life? And sitting behind a desk every single day was not my passion. And I just felt that I wanted to make impact. I wanted to create something that could give value to people. I wanted to create something within the, the health business. And I wanted to help people live a healthier lifestyle. So I actually started using social media and trying to create a when you say like a movement within health, trying to share my story and mindset and a lot of a lot of recipes, healthy recipes. And from that came, uh, I created a, a cookbook and which became my first step on my journey with the Protein Kitchen. So it was actually a movement and a movement about health. You know, health was for me supposed to be simple, fun and tasty. And from the cookbook, it has been quite a journey and I always dreamt about actually working together with 7-Eleven. I wanted to make health more simple and available to people out there. And I wanted to be able to make physical products and meals. So, so also health could be available to people. Everywhere. Yeah. And you, I mean, you're very good at connecting. I think you, 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 you talk about this a lot. I mean, you're, you're certainly better at connecting than, than I am, Cecilia. I think you have 200,000 followers on Instagram. I've got, I think, about 194. Um, so, um, so I need to, I've got a lot to learn, I think. <laughs> well, yes, I have been connecting a lot with people. And since I've, always, I've also worked as a physical coach and a personal trainer, so I've always knew what people actually needed when they wanted to live a healthy lifestyle. And a lot of people are always challenged and they don't have time to cook or make healthy meals from the bottom themselves, or they don't even know how to cook the healthy meals. So I just thought, you know, it could be great to make food that were that was clean and without any artificials, just high quality. And I hope it's okay to say it, but we always we always say no bullshit. It's because it's it's not filled with a lot of hidden calories and not hidden with a lot of sugars and not hidden with a lot of other artificials. So that was my vision, you know, to to make health available to people. And, and, and this, so, you, you mentioned 7-Eleven, Denmark, and obviously a lot of the programs are going to be talking about the right hand convenience team and, and the 7-Eleven brand in Denmark. But yeah. you've got a pretty special relationship with these guys, haven't you? We do. Yes, uh, we work closely together. And when I first started in 7-Eleven four years ago, I, I just had a vision. So from there, we actually together developed a lot of products. And ever since we've kept being innovative together. I've had ideas, they have had ideas, and we have just had a lot of trial and, and errors, of course, also, but we've tested a lot, a lot of products there. Um, 
And we have, I've done a lot of store visits, events, we've done a lot of movements on social media, doing a lot of giveaways, had a lot of fun, you know, online and offline, connecting with customers, talking to customers. And, and I also focused on getting a relationship with the franchisees, which, which is really important for me as a supplier. Also to understand the business, but also to understand the customer's needs and getting their feedback and see how does the, the product actually work in the field. So it's, uh, we have been working closely together for many years now, and I love the way we co-brand our products and the way we, we work on this vision together. And that, I guess that connection for, with the customers and also, as you mentioned, the franchisees is in, in this store is, is, is one of the secrets to your success, I suspect. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's very important because without the knowledge from the field, you don't really know what you're doing, I, I feel at least for me. Uh, so for me, it, it gives me a great understanding of what the customers need and what works for the franchisees out there in the stores. So that's, that's just perfect for me. And that's how I keep, you know, getting my ideas is from being out there talking to the customers and yes, talking to the franchisees. I always ask them, what do you need? What do you need? <laughs> so I always try to, to make something that's new and still, you know, when we also try to keep being sustainable and being trendy and try new stuff. Well, so absolutely. So we're seeing some images. That's one of the things uh, I love about 7-Eleven. They've been brave, I believe. They have, they absolutely have. And, yes, you uh, can see some of the images. Yeah, so this is this is some of the things that you do. Some of these images are taken before pre, pre-COVID, pre obviously, but but you, the taste, I'm quite intrigued yes. <laughs> by the amount of tasting you do in stores with consumers. You think that's pretty important. Obviously, it's something that the industry has done for some time, but you do a lot of it, don't you? I've done so many tastings <laughs> from uh, either on a train station or at a, get, at a gas station or in city. We've done so many events from, you know, at the airport or I've been out there and I really know the franchisees well and, and know the stores well. I've been to all the stores, I think. Uh, <laughs> so I've done a lot of samplings, but that has been really giving to me. You know, it's, it's the way to connect to customers and really tell the good story behind the brand and also behind the products. And, you know, having the, the customers getting a good, you know, have, give them a smile and also for them to try the product and then they'll buy it again and buy it again. And then it's about starting the ripples in the water. Well, I guess you, and you keep, you need to keep innovating, I guess, don't you, in terms of staying, you know, slightly ahead of, of their expectations so that you can come up with something which is original and unique and, and, and I guess almost a sort of pleasant surprise to them when they walk into the store. Yes, it's, it's, of course, we need to be innovative all the time. Uh, this, you know, the past year has been quite difficult to be innovative, uh, but I'm working on a lot of new stuff and excited to, to work on that with 7-Eleven as well. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think you've, you've done a terrific job. And, um, you know, once again, you know, thank you for, for showing us a bit of Copenhagen. We'd obviously, the, one of the reasons that um, we came up with this world tour idea is that I think in 21, you know, we've spent a lot of time in 2020 on this program. And obviously the industry has spent a lot of time globally benchmarking and working out how to cope with new customer behaviors and all the restrictions of, of, of the pandemic. but. What we wanted to do uh, in 21, of course, we'll still be looking at that, but we wanted to take a very positive view of this year as the year of recovery, Cecilia, and, and really sort of look at, you know, what the big strategic uh, opportunities are for us as an industry. So I think it's just terrific to, to have you sort of talk, talk about that from a, a supplier perspective. And, and obviously that product innovation is, is pretty important, isn't it? So, you know, big congratulations to you and what you've done with your business. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Great, so, great. Yeah. I would say, okay, well, if we could say one thing, it's just, you know, keep yeah. being innovative and keep being present online and creating community and connect with the customers. That's important. Absolutely. And, and I think we've got a lot, a lot to learn. So what I'd like you to do is, is stay with the program and listen to, to what your, you know, your partners in 7-Eleven, Rice and Convenience Denmark um, have to say. I'm sure they'll be saying one or two nice things about you, Cecilia. So <laughs> we appreciate you. Um, you coming on the program and thanks again for for filming doing that filming which i know a lot of people appreciated watching over the weekend so thank you for that and uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll speak to you again soon i'm sure thank you so much terrific right so 
we think you know a key part of this story is is obviously focusing on um on on the small supplier side of it and uh, as as you saw it's very uh, very kind of cecilia to give us a bit of a showcase into three new uh, 7-eleven stores around uh, around uh, copenhagen um which uh, was on our video pre-watch what I'd like to do now is is open up um, the uh, the main segment of the program in terms of time, which is devoted to to the Seven uh, Eleven um, business uh, as it operates in in um, Denmark. And I'd like to welcome Jesper, Per, and Tanya um, to uh, to Shop Talk Live. So, guys, if you could join us now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. <clears throat> so, how are you doing? First, at first of all, we are doing fine. Thank you. And uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting us to this. Uh, I think it reminds us of that there is actually a world outside the Danish borders now when we can't travel anywhere. So, so the feeling of being close connected to other markets in the world is actually pretty nice. Well, we, that's why we, we, we like this idea of world tour, um, Jesper. I mean, we, you know, it's what we really all want to do in 21 and we want to get out there and uh, and and come and visit um, great businesses like you. So so we're delighted uh, we're delighted to do do it virtually. Um, let me just introduce you, guy. Obviously, Jesper, you you know you you're um, you're the MD of of right hand in in, uh, in in Denmark. Um, per um, Duerhein, your 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 category manager for food and at a trained chef. And I'm going to obviously that's going to inform some of the things that that you talk about on the program. And and Tanya Jakobsen, your ops director in charge of all the city. Um, and railway stores um, with uh, f operated um, by Rice and Convenience Denmark in, um, in 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 the country as well, aren't you? So um, you 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 bring a, a food um, uh, innovation and, a, and an operational perspective to, to the discussion. So thanks very much for joining us. That's a slight change to the um, the announced lineup, but uh, I think it's going to take us in a very interesting direction. So Tanya, Per, um, Jasper, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Much. <clears throat> So Jesper, if I could just talk to you first, really, just looking at the big the big picture, if you like. We've known each other for many years. Um, you you and your team have have accomplished uh, what is universally accepted, uh, and I think the forty eight countries says it all, really, in terms of the interest in what you've done as a business in, for our industry globally. It's been a very significant convenience transformation, has hasn't it? Can you just? Uh, it's difficult to summarize it in a you know it's in a short sort of brief but uh, give us a bit of a summary of, of what you've changed in the business you know what that transformation achieved sure. uh, first of all thank you to cecilia for the very nice things she's saying about us we really appreciate the partnership we have with her and i think the partnership shown here is really key to our success in general in the danish marketplace um i mean there's there has been going so much on in the Danish business and the transformation has been huge. So I think we have enough to talk about this for a week. Um, today, we will mainly focus on uh, part of the transformation, especially the food transformation, because we believe that has been key to our success today. Um, over the last 10 years, a lot of stuff is going on, has been going on in our company in Denmark. And, and some of the facts is that we have uh, increased our Danish business by approximately 400% over the last 10 years. So a lot of things has happened. Um, if I should just touch on some of the most important issues uh, regarding our strategy change, up until 2012, opening hours were regulated in Denmark by the government and up until 12, uh, only convenience stores could be open at night time and uh, weekends, bank holidays, etc. And of course, that helped our business in terms of uh, top up sales and, and sales of products in general. We understood quite early in this uh, period of time that that legislation would not survive. Um, and from 12 and onwards, that was basically taken away. So from 12, everybody in retail could be open when and where they wanted. And we thought that if we were just continuing with the same focus that, as we used to have, we didn't really have a future. So we came from a very traditional kiosk concept where a lot of the turnover and profitability was based on traditional categories like tobacco, magazines, newspapers, gaming. Uh, so our decision was basically, how can we move our concept from being 
a kiosk concept selling a few food products into a, con a food concept selling a few kiosk products. And saying that does not mean that we wanted to stop selling all the traditional stuff. We still sell that and we will probably do that forever. But that was not enough to make us known or to make us differentiate ourselves from the competition. So basically we decided that part of the foundation, part of making the company future proof was that we wanted to move dramatically into the food category. So when I joined many years ago, I remember we had sandwiches produced in Germany, nothing bad about that, but they had like three weeks shelf life. We had to get out of that. And we started uh, talking to a lot of small upcoming companies in the Danish market. Cecilia is one of them and has become very successful. So a lot of things has happened over the time. Um, we are a value driven company. Uh, our value number seven, we have eight core values. Our value number seven is basically the customer is our ultimate boss. And I'm really getting impressed and humble listening to Cecilia because it feels like she is working on the basis of the same values. And the good thing about Cecilia and her company is that although she has grown and become bigger as a company, she never forgets the interaction with the customers. And I think that is probably one of the key areas for our success in the Danish marketplace. Never ever forget about who is paying your salary at the end of the day, that is the customers. So when we formed this new strategy, we sat down and thought, okay, what does the customer really want to have from us? And how can we in the best possible way deliver on that? So we did talk to a lot of customers. We realized as well that the most of the convenience brands in the Danish marketplace, probably in the whole world, are more or used to more or less deliver or offer the same customer proposition. Right. So we decided if we should have a future, we should do it. We had to change that. We had to find areas where we could outperform the competition, areas that were important to the customers, areas that could generate new customers into our stores. And uh, we settled, we decided to go on food in general, food bakery in hot and cold burgers. And our goal was to introduce products that were uh, better quality and overall allowing customers to live a healthier life. That does not mean that we don't sell hot dogs and pizzas today. We still do that, we will continue, but we would like our customers to have a choice. So if you are on the go seven days a week, you are a lot in your car, wherever, you will still have an opportunity to live decent or healthy because we have the product range. That was really vital to us. So yeah. um, it, it was quite a journey coming from the old convenience concept into the new, and it took a lot of convincing regarding the big, very big brand, global brands, because in the beginning, I think they were afraid of that. They were um, afraid of losing business. And of course, if you introduce a healthy salad from Cecilia Protein Kitchen, and you still have another more global brand salad product on the shelf, yeah, that might be a competitor to your original product. But I think we managed to convince our big partners that this is not a question of competing. This is simply a question of making sure that our brand is relevant to more customers. So that has been the driver. And I, I, I'm happy to say that the last five, six years, all global suppliers, very big suppliers as well, have bought into this strategy. They realize and understand that we need to offer something for everybody in our stores. So I think... I think yes, but just to just to butt in, I, I mean, I think that that view of that sort of very broad perspective that you have in terms of obviously bringing in uh, new suppliers, but also, um, if you like, explaining your strategy and putting the time and resources into doing that with the the big guys who you still need to keep on board and and work closely with, you know, is is another reason for for you know for, for your success in in doing this. I mean, I I just think it's 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 hugely uh, impressive. Um, now, Per, if I can bring you in now, I mean, I, Jasper, I'm, I'm sure um, you won't mind me saying that when you introduced Per uh, to me, I think you said, look, this guy is, has been key in terms of the, the product side, delivering the product side, um, which is obviously, as you've been saying, Jasper, you know, crucial to, 
to, to the success of what you've done with fresh food. But Per, you're, you're a trained chef, aren't you? Um, tell us a bit about your, you know, what your perspective on some of the things that we've been talking about so far and, and, and what you feel you've done in your, in your job. Yeah, uh, Dan, as uh, Jesper just mentioned, our new food journey changes started back in, in 2013 uh, in connection with the new Danish law that also allowed the Danish grocery retailers to have open almost an entire day. Therefore, we needed a new strategy for our business because Seven Lemon suddenly became relevant. So we have to inform ourselves of being a classic kiosk with a little range of food products, finally classic fast food like pizza and sauces pre-packaged sandwiches and salads with a shelf life of 10 to 14 days to become a convenience store with more focus on fresh and healthy options within food, bakery and beverage. Because actually we saw analysis show us that our ultimate busted customers began to want to healthier alternatives on the go. Therefore, we started looking at the new partners who can help us on the new journey because our fresh foods Fresh food suppliers at that time understand for changes. Therefore, we started connecting, uh, contacting uh, well-known restaurant and cafe uh, chains in, in Copenhagen, uh, like Kofogo, the Paleo, and the Protein Kitchen uh, with Cecilia, which were more innovative and who might also be interested to grow their business in new areas together with us. Actually, that was the start of the, the new food journey against fresher and more healthier innovative products on the on the on the shelf uh, but working with small innovative suppliers is also a win-win uh, for the suppliers and us because it gives us us opportunity to differentiate uh, our offers from, from our competitors to be first mover on a long range of new product in the market plus it's faster yeah. Per, yeah. if i could come in on on that point i mean it's i guess that's the point that jesper made i mean having a unique product that you can't buy anywhere else is quite unusual isn't it in the convenience store sector in many countries so I think it's important just to sort of emphasize the point you've just made per which is that you know looking at some of those products I mean okay it's mango it's yeah. but it's carrot and apple and it's got collagen um, mm -hmm. you know that, that these are unusual products that might that I guess that they surprise customers a bit don't they when they when they see them and um, you know um, I guess it's uh, it that's that's that, that uniqueness is uh, is pretty key isn't it exactly Dan. that's that's the key to the whole success uh, with the fresh fruit and, and the bakery and and and, and the beverage uh, category we have uh, different type of products you can see on traditional grocery stores that's that's the key to to the whole success and also together with the the small suppliers and uh, our franchisees uh, out in the stores that's correct yeah then. Yeah, yeah, no, no, really interesting, uh, Per. Now, Tanya, let me just bring you in thinking about operations for a minute, because obviously we've got beautiful looking stores, you know, looking at those photos and obviously looking at the videos. I think, you know, the world is, is, is really persuaded by what you've done with, with how the stores look and, and, the, and the atmosphere that you're creating with your store design. Now we've heard a lot about the the, you know, the product strategy, we've worked with small suppliers and yet you've kept the big suppliers on board. You've got unique products in the store, but thinking about it from a, an operational perspective, which is very much your concern as ops director, um, this is a big, this is a new ball game, isn't it? You know, in terms of operational, because, you know, you're, you're, you're ordering the products, the franchisees are ordering the products from the stores in the evening. You're making the products overnight and then you're delivering them in the morning. And, I think you know it's about a third, isn't it, of your sales is in fresh uh, right. now. So, didn't that give you a a few sleepless nights uh, okay. in terms of um, you know making it all work, making it happen, delivering, executing? Um, no, not really. Uh, but uh, let me answer your question properly by taking you back to the very beginning when we uh, started the journey with our franchisees. As Pierre just said, the strategy was that 7-Eleven should become a destination known for a wide range of healthy options. First of all, it was very important that every one of our franchisees understood the reason why we wanted to start up the journey and that they were willing to back up on the strategy. Many did, but we had to replace around 30% uh, of the franchisees doing, uh, during the following year, mostly because they couldn't uh, execute properly on a decent 
level of cleanliness and some because they turned out not to have the will nor the skills and I will get back to that subject in a short while because it's quite important and essential. Another thing that is important to mention speaking of healthier options is that quite often you operate with products that has a lower margin than we were used to due to the higher quality and freshness. Now, in the beginning, the franchisees were a bit concerned about that, but it changed on a positive direction as they realized that our ultimate boss, the customer, was very happy for the new assortment. The sales increased and they realized that they became more relevant in, in the market. And after around a year or so, we started out in the stores with producing our own sandwiches and uh, different kinds of buns. And that became, I believe, a turning point in many ways. First of all, because the margins are almost twice as big as for the pre-packed products. And furthermore, it's also a way of increasing our freshness to a whole new level. Uh, now, Dan, I am aware that the clock is ticking, but there are some keywords which is important for me to mention as well. Uh, once is uh, the cleanliness. Obviously, it's always important to have clean stores, but when you decide to become a destination um, of fresh and healthy food, the cleanliness becomes even more important. Our customer has to have the confidence in what we do. Uh, the next thing is a personal appearance. All employees has to wear an apron. It looks better and it leaves our customers with the right perception that we are in the food business. Um, food in the front, it's important that uh, the healthier options uh, are placed in the front of the store so that it becomes very visible to the customer that we have it. Furthermore, the food uh, has to be placed in such a way that it's easy and very fast for the customer to navigate. Um, making life easier, speed of service is essential for convenience business. And then sampling or <coughs> tastings. It's important that the stores regularly give the customer the opportunity to taste new products, either in a setup made by the store themselves or by the vendor. And Cecilia, you have been amazing at doing that with our franchisees. Thank you. It, it, it really means a lot to us. Um, Consistency, that is actually one of the areas where we are focusing a lot these days. We, um, we need to approve on, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we need to approve on this area. It has to be like at the McDonald's, you're always confident that a McFeast will be prepared the exact same way, no matter if you buy it in Shanghai or in Denmark. Yeah, well then I could, uh, I could talk about this for hours, but I don't think we have the time for it. It's just that, this is such an interesting journey uh, where new demands and trends always keeps us on our toes. Um, thank you. I, really, really impressive, Tanya. And I, I think, you know, I, I guess one of the um, challenges of, of leading, and I think you've, you've, been, you've all been leaders um, in terms of, you know, taking, taking some of the sort of big steps in this transformation that, that you have, you know, Leading is difficult, isn't it, in this respect, because you have to bring everybody on board. You've already mentioned suppliers. You have to find new suppliers. You've, and then you've, we've talked a little bit about franchisees and so on in terms of giving them the right skills, as you've mentioned, uh, Tanya, but, but also giving them the confidence that this is going to work um, when you really haven't got that many examples um, to, to show them, you know, as, as illustrations of, 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 of evidencing that. I mean, I guess the great thing for a lot of the retailers watching this today is that you are that evidence um, because it's a journey that, that you, you, you've taken and therefore, you know, they're, they're going to be in a much stronger position to, to do that themselves in their own business because of what you've done. So, you know, I think, um, you, you, you know, congratulations again for the, for, to the team for, you know, very much leading on this. Um, one question though around, maybe it's just some, some of the sort of issues that you've had to contend with and particularly thinking about small suppliers. Um, how do you scale up the distribution? I don't know who wants to jump in on this, but obviously scaling it up from, you know, a supplier who's relatively small, you know, perhaps when you first started working with some of these companies per, and has and, and now grown, you know, to, to, so that you can go nationwide uh, with, with their products. I mean, how, how, did you, how did you get over that hurdle? I think I'll, uh, I'll answer that. I think 
exactly the, the, the scaling issue is one of the first issues you will meet when you work with very small suppliers. Cecilia is a very good example. I think Cecilia started her production in her own private kitchen with a few SKUs, a few uh, a number of products. And, and worked, it worked pretty well with Cecilia, but we have realized quite often with small suppliers that when they suddenly need to have barcodes on their products, and from that stage and onwards, it, it's just growing. But, but the fact that they need to understand that it requires a different packaging, et cetera, when you are scaling, that takes some resources from us. We have, as you know, our own distribution center in, in our company. So, so when, when we finally get over the issues with barcodes and lists of ingredients on each product, then it's really just growing. It's important in the beginning to find products that are relevant to most of our customers. So you will get the scale from day one, because if you are very specific about a certain area of Denmark and you don't really get the scale, then you might lose sort of a, the belief in that it's going to work. So, so I think it's important in the beginning to find products that are relevant to many customers. So, I mean, I guess, you know, just thinking about the, the implications of, of what you've done, Jasper, uh, on, on the business, um, your customers very happy. You've got, you got the results as well, didn't you? Of course, this is the other thing, I guess, we saw some of that in the, in the, in the video, which was one of the pre-watches. But tell us a bit about the results, because obviously that's what we're all here for. We wouldn't be able to do any of these things without the right results. But I think you've, you've nailed that a bit, haven't you? Yeah, I think we have. Uh, I'm, I'm getting slightly humble because I, I'm not the right one to praise our business, but I think we have chosen the right strategy. Looking back, we would not change anything. And the strategy we chose like seven, eight years ago is actually still the strategy we're working on today. From a financial result standpoint, we came out of 19 with the best result ever in Denmark. And as we said on the stage in London, when we, when we got the price, it is absolutely amazing to get a price like this. But the most important thing to achieve is actually we have customer growth year on year, because that proves that we are doing something that is relevant for more and more customers. So customer growth is one of the KPIs we have a lot of focus on. If we start losing customers year on year, we are not doing the right things. So customer growth is important, of course, Financial results are very important as well. Uh, and as I said, the best result ever was in 2019. And we were ready to deliver or over deliver on that in 2020. But uh, then suddenly something happened, we couldn't sort of manage. So, so overall, I think we are happy with the results and we are just longing and looking forward to get back on track when the virus is, is finally sort of disappearing. Well, my last question is going to be on looking at, at 2020 and 2021. But before we do that, I don't think you should get away with that. us showing a few more pictures of you receiving the NAX award uh, on, on screen um, uh, when, uh, when, when you won that. And of course, the great thing about the NAX International Convenience Retail of the Year Award is it does, uh, obviously, having the NAX, uh, if you like, accolade does allow the, the business and what they've done to be celebrated globally. And, and I guess... You know the, the the interest in this in this um, program just illustrates uh, what a great how great it is for, for our industry to have benchmarks that they can uh, aspire to. So again, um, nice to see you you on screen, Per and uh, and Tanya as well as uh, as you, Jasper, back uh, back in 2019, which seems a long time ago, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, from a business point of view, um, you know, is uh, is 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 not that not that long in many ways. Final question um, for your segment. Um, Jasper, I perhaps address this to you and Tanya and, and Per, please chip in. But, you know, obviously you, you came up with a new strategy for the world as it was in 20, uh, well, I guess it, before 2020. Um, how did that new strategy uh, cope with the, with, with, with the pandemic? How is it coping with the pandemic? Um, I think is, is, is probably a question in, in many, many people's minds in the audience. Yeah. Uh, the good thing about this session, I think personally has been that we have not had a lot of focus on Corona because everybody has the same challenge. Everybody has learned a lot about how to deal with it. But of course, this is just such an important part of our business. So we should touch on it. I think personally, 
now we have closed 2020 and the fiscal accounts are closed. Uh, I think personally, we have come out of 2020 better than many of our competitors. Uh, we have come out better, to be honest, than we actually thought. Let's say mid 2020, our anticipation was that it was going to be worse. And I think one of the main reasons, well, a couple of main reasons for the quite good result in spite of Corona, I think is first of all, the strategy where we moved from traditional kiosk convenience products into the food business has helped us a lot because you might during a pandemic stop buying magazines, newspapers, tobacco, etc., but you would still like to buy food, bakery and beverages. So that itself has helped us. The second issue I want to touch is that very early in the pandemic, we decided that, well, we have to stay profitable, which is actually one of our core eight values. And instead of focusing on the 25% customer we lost, which we did on average in 2020, we turned that around and said, well, we still have 75% customers coming, shopping in our stores. So now it's time for us to prove that we are true value-based leaders. It's time for us to prove that we have the best service, the best product range in convenience in Denmark, because we believe that during this pandemic, we actually have founded or made the foundation for our future success. So even though it's been tough and it is tough, I think we've only had two or three stores closed. The rest of the entire chain has remained open and we have had a lot of focus on making sure we are doing the best possible in terms of the 75% customers that still show up in our stores. Well, uh, you know, it's great to hear that the strategy is, 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 is you know, has, has done well during uh, 2020. And, and obviously what we, as, as you say, yes, but what we really want to focus on uh, for a lot of the, the time we, we talk on Shop Talk this year is, is looking towards the year of recovery and, uh, you know, the right strategies for our industry. And, you know, I, I just, again, like to congratulate you and, and team and, of course, uh, yourself, per uh, Tanya, for, for for your very important roles in this, and um, right hand convenience uh, generally for you know for, for 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 their success. So congratulations once again, and we really appreciate you sharing um, you know the, your time and 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 this case study for the industry. And of course, we'd have liked to have been in Copenhagen. We've tried to get you as close as we can, and uh, thank you for the hospitality. Thank you very much. You're thank welcome. you. You're welcome, ben. Right. So um, why don't you stay with us um, if you can uh, if you can just stay with us, uh, you know, in the background, guys, um, we're going to go to the, the final segment of the program today. Um, and uh, we'd like to what I'd like to do uh, is is welcome uh, the NAX team um, to the to the screen. We're going to be look, talking to the NAX Europe team and they're going to reflect a bit on what we've just discussed, that they all bring very un unique experience to, to this so let me welcome you, Mark, um, NAC's Director, Global, uh, Christian Warning, Marco Fuhrer, and of course, Magnar Mockelgaard. Uh, so guys, uh, welcome. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Well, the snow was melting, so all is good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, of course, Mark, you're in the UK. Christian, uh, you're, you're in, in Hamburg. Marco, you're in Switzerland. And... Uh, and Magna um, is uh, is in Oslo. Um, so we have a sort of uh, a very broad geography here. Mark, let me go to you first. Um, just thinking about the you 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 might have recognised the award that uh, that that Jesper and team were very happy with. Why did they win it? What was your from your perspective? Well, if you if if you think about the challenges that that our industry faces, um, no, no matter what it is or what it has been, there are always two ways to react. Either you do something half-heartedly, or you dive in and you really address it and and you invest and you have a strategy and and, and you really do something the right way. Uh, it happened to our industry uh, many times. Think about 30, 40 years ago when petrol stations were selling fuel and uh, car repair then suddenly car repair went away so they were stuck with fuel what did they do thinking about well what's what's next and the answer was fmcg and some started just selling a few 
chocolate bars and fizzy drinks and some really created a convenience retail experience and they were the ones that succeeded and nothing else is happening right now um for a while we know that uh, a couple of our categories are under threat uh, tobacco will go down there will be regulation on alcohol there will be regulation on sugar on salty food um fuel sales will go down at some point so the question is what's next and the answer has been for a long time actually now 10 20 years food service and healthier options and again some retailers do something half-heartedly you paint it green it's healthy uh, you add a little bit of sandwich sales that's it and some really go all the way and um think about how can you create an experience from that and how can you really serve your new customer need and i think this is what uh, right hand with 7-eleven in denmark has done and i think that is um if i read through what the uh, jurors were were writing down um, um about the different stores and 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 about why they think uh this store should win uh, this this is really it it's, it's really they were going all the way in and doing it the right way no, well, well said. Um, Christian, what about the small supplier innovation side of, side of this? I know this is something that you've spent some time that you, you think is very important, but um, do, what, what's your reflection on what we've just been discussing? Yeah, I, I think uh, what Jasper and his, his team from 7-Eleven in Denmark is doing is, is not only spearheading the innovative right on convenience division in the Nordics, but also in our industry. It, it, it's really... It, the blueprint for other retailers, if you ask me. Um, the, the successful cooperation, and it's not only with the protein kitchen, it's with lemonade from Germany, you find them on their shelves. And, and they, they have a good cooperation with other startups like Liquid Barcodes from Norway in each and every area. And, and I think it's very much reflecting kind of the actual zeitgeist of, of stronger together. And, and, and I strongly recommend retailers not always to reinventing the wheel, thinking one can do everything best in-house only. Yeah? The IT guys, uh, I'm looking to them <laughs> especially, yeah? but also in, in, other, in other areas. Yeah? Um, give those young and innovative teams the room and, and believe in them. And, 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 and 7-Eleven Denmark shows it's better for their business. So the financial betterment of both sides. And, and I think... Uh, it's it's really one uh, others sh should have a, a deep deep dive look into. No, I I I, I think very very well said. Um, completely agree. It's that sort of in, in innovative um, approach that they they've applied to to all areas. Marco, you know, looking obviously, you're 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 you know the German speaking markets uh, extremely well. You're based you're based in Switzerland with your with your business, but. Thinking about this um, from the perhaps looking not just at Switzerland but the German speaking markets in general, you know, what what do you think the do you think the learnings are applicable in those markets too? Are they applicable anywhere? I guess is the question. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm really fascinated by this concept because it's so holistically implemented. Uh, in Switzerland, uh, I find all of uh, these individual elements. Uh, we have private labels, we have uh, a really good quality of freshness, we have self-checkout, but what I don't find is this stringent form in a single store, uh, and this is not present here, and uh, I think um, uh, it's not present in Germany. Uh, it therefore shows me impressively that it's not enough to implement just one topic to say we are fresh, we are this, we are that. It must be really uh, a holistically uh, approach. So many retailers still uh, lack the courage or the resources to change. So uh, we still have uh, potential for optimization at the high level in the German speaking part. And for me, this is the most important insight for our market here uh, in the German speaking, speaking part of uh, Europe. Very good, very good. It, it's, it, I mean, it is a great benchmark um, for almost every market, isn't it? I think we're, we're all, coming towards that, you know, that, 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 that statement. Magnar, obviously you have a unique sort of position um, in, in, in terms of understanding the journey because it was something that you uh, spent a lot of time on yourself. Um, um, obviously, uh, you know, 20 plus years in, in the right-hand convenience biz business. Um, 
Can you tell us a little bit about, give us your insight on, on obviously we, we focus very much on Copenhagen and the Danish business today. Um, how important has, has the work that, that that team, Jasper's team, that they've done in the Danish market been across the right-hand uh, markets? Because obviously it's, a, you know, they're one of the big convenience giants in Europe, don't just operate in uh, Denmark. Tell us a bit about, you know, how important that was for the, for the business as a whole outside of Denmark. Let me, let me just start by saying that it is very clear that Jesper and his team is best in class among the seven countries in which right and convenience operate. They are best in team with regard to fresh, health, healthy and trendy foods. A key value within the right hand organization is uh, that being close to the customer and, and knowing that the customer is your ultimate boss very much of the decisions are made as close to the customers uh, as possible, which also means that each country has a lot of control over their own strategies. And uh, let us also say that uh, Reiten loves to say that uh, they shall copy with pride, whatever is good for the other countries. But this is not something that is very easy to copy. This is not something you can just copy paste. During all my travels to Denmark, I've observed Jesper and his team during several years, working very systematically on this, almost stubbornly to get where they are. And of course, their suppliers are local. So yes, it has had a great impact on the right hand convenience organization with regard to being more brave with regard to which foods you have in your, uh, your um, stores, setting higher standards and working with local, uh, local um, uh, suppliers. But let's also uh, realize that right hand uh, in Denmark is working with local Danish suppliers, which have a scalability uh, issue with 7-Eleven Denmark alone. So it's not easy just to bring one supplier across the borders to uh, Sweden or, or Norway. But of course, the example is there, the proof that it's possible to go that way and which has led uh, the other countries, not only the 7-Eleven countries, but all, all the uh, six other countries within right and convenience realize that there is a lot they can do and they have done a lot because of what 7-Eleven Denmark has done. Very, 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 very good. And it's, uh, yeah, as, as you say, I, I like one particular phrase that you used, uh, Magna, which was, you saw this developing over many years with a, almost a kind of stubbornness um and 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 i guess it's that it's that sort of determination isn't it over a long period of time when you're looking at such a dramatic change that affects all aspects of the business as we've as we've been hearing you know which is is really calls for that uh, that that stubbornness to you know to, to 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 keep on keep on going and keep on driving so you know very very well made point there well um Guys, uh, you know, I'd like to, we're, we're, we're bang on time. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us and just listening to the episode and, and, and reflecting on it. Um, I'd just like to, to thank you for, you for joining and, and thanks to, to all panelists, um, you know, for, for, uh, for joining Shop Talk Live today. I'm sure we'll be hearing from you, you soon in, uh, you know, yourself, Mark, Christian. I'm sure we'd like to hear more about the German market and Marco, of course, in Switzerland um, and Magna. Um, you know, we've, we've, we're a lot of innovation coming out of the Nordics, so it's always great to, to hear from you. So Jasper, Tanya, um, uh, Per and Cecilia, thanks very much for joining uh, Shop Talk Live, um, episode 19. Um, so um, if I can just tell you about what's coming up, we are going to continue with our Shop Talk Live world tour. Um, we've got a lot of the world left. We've just done the first tour date, which was in Copenhagen. I think a pretty interesting start. Uh, a lot of very good learnings from the right hand convenience business there. Next on the list is Latin America. We're going to be in Latin America on Friday, the 5th of February, and we're going to be spending quite a bit of time with Puma. Rodrigo Zavala, CEO of America and Global Commercial, 
with Puma Energy will be one of our guests on the show next Friday at 2 p.m. UK time. So we very much look forward to that next tour date on the Shop Talk Live World Tour. So good afternoon and thanks very much for joining us. See you again soon.